Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to a special City Club Forum at the Westfield Insurance Studio Theater at the Idea Center at Playhouse Square. I'm Rick Jackson, senior host and producer for IdeaStream, pleased to introduce today's speakers. Cleveland Browns co-owner Dee Haslam and Jim Rooney, author of A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule. Tonight is a night NFL fans anticipate all year long, the Cleveland Browns-Pittsburgh Steelers game, long-standing rivalry that has a new twist now that Jimmy and Dee Haslam, former minority owners for the Steelers, are now co-owners of the Browns. The Pittsburgh Steelers, the AFC's oldest franchise, has been owned by the Rooney family since its inception in 1933. Dan Rooney, the Steelers' second owner, is remembered as much for his strong advocacy for equality of opportunity for both minorities and women as he is for the franchise's six Super Bowl rings. Much of his storied life is chronicled in the new book, A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule, written by his son, Jim Rooney. More than a biography or a profile, the book traces the building of a prestigious franchise in the NFL, the dynasty of the Steelers in the 1970s. Rooney's decades of work to support reconciliation in Northern Ireland, which led to him becoming U.S. Ambassador to Ireland in 2009, and the Rooney Rule, an NFL policy since 2003 that requires teams to interview a diverse slate of candidates for head coaching jobs. Today we'll talk with Mr. Rooney about his father's life and commitment to diversity and inclusion. Now joining Mr. Rooney on stage is Dee Haslam, co-owner of the Cleveland Browns and Major League Soccer's Columbus Crew. She is one of eight women with primary ownership of an NFL team and is the first woman to be on Major League Soccer's Board of Governors. A University of Tennessee graduate, Ms. Haslam began her career in the television business working for her father, Boss Ross Bagwell. In 1999, she and partner Rob Lundgren took over Bagwell Entertainment and renamed it River Media, R-I-V-R, a successful company whose productions include the well-known Trading Spaces and Whale Wars, among other shows. I love those shows, T. Today, she's actively involved in both franchises and their respective philanthropic and community efforts. Her work helped earn Brown's ownership, the Tank Younger Award from the Fritz Pollard Alliance, given to her for having built one of the most diverse front offices in all of sports. Esteemed guests, members, friends of the City Club, would you please join me in welcoming to our stage Dee Haslam and Jim Rooney. Now, the book you see there on the table was released today. I think you'd find it an interesting read. Jim tells me he designed it with four different narratives because his dad did accomplish just so much. And to be honest, it reads pretty much like four shorter volumes. Uh, for much of the conversation, we'll deal directly with the implementation of the Rooney Rule, diversity in and out of the front office, its impact on the NFL of today. But there's a lot more in the text. A lot more is in that text. For instance, those of you who are local may be surprised to learn just how much Dan Rooney valued and treasured the Cleveland Browns. And that's where I'd like to start today, Jim, because as far back as the 1950s, these two storied franchises needed each other as rivals, as business partners. It was a far less lucrative NFL back then. Right. So, Rick, thank you. And, and Dee, thank you so much for hosting me here in Cleveland. So it's wonderful to, to be in Cleveland. Cleveland is my second home. So I went to Gilmore Academy and grew up in this town. And it's, um, it's, it's always wonderful to be back. So there's many chapters to this, this story and this rivalry, but on sort of the, the ownership side, um, you know, it starts with Paul Brown bringing this great team into the NFL, and the Steelers were horrible back then, and not too many people went to games in Pittsburgh. So when the Steelers would play the Browns, uh, you know, that was, the, that was our best sell out of the year. We would, we would get the most fans to come back in the, the early 50s because of the great Browns team. You know, you go through the later years and, and you know, we worked together on so many different things throughout those, those years. I talk about that in the book some. And then uh, Dee and Jimmy came along and, and really helped our family at a time when we were at a crossroads from an ownership standpoint. And, and you know, their investment and their partnership meant a tremendous amount to us at a, at a really critical time. And, uh, and now they're, they're taking the Browns. I, I hope they take them to the, 
to the point where uh, you know we can get back to that rivalry as, as mm -hmm. much as after everyone buys my book, then they can hate this team. <laughs> <laughs> Skip ahead for me to 1999, Browns 2.0. People don't realize how much your dad was instrumental in making sure that this city got this team back where it belonged. Right, and I, and I think it goes to to a couple of things. I mean, generally, my father always believed that people in Pittsburgh and and then getting to know Cleveland had this special quality, this ability to sort of combine toughness and kindness in a way that, that I think was, is uncommon. And I, I don't know that the, you know, the rest of the world does that as well as these two towns do. And that was something my father talked about because you know, he was at high school football games in Mayfield and Independence and, and all over this region. And, and um, you know, so, so when the Browns were about to leave, the, the vote came up and you know my father said like you know the quote is I'm for Cleveland and you know uh, so he stood up and 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 really felt that it was important that we we make this commitment to these fans that have been so loyal that have had this you know had this fervor and love for this team that this is basically the birthplace of, of football you know between Pittsburgh and Cleveland and and then went on to, to sort of you know orchestrate you know, making sure we got a team back. And, and it actually, Roger Goodell, who's now commissioner, was the league official who was assigned to the, the sort of day-to-day -day task. So my father and Roger worked with the, the city and the uh, county and the state to, to make sure the stadium got built. They negotiated with Al Lerner, and, and you know, the, the learners came in and, and, and brought the team back. So sort of every part of that process from, from them leaving until uh, we, we, we launched the new, the new Browns. My father was, was heavily involved in that. D, the current leadership at the Browns, you owe a lot of the management style you have to lessons learned at the feet of Dan Rooney. That's true. I mean, Dan, um, I mean, the Rooney, the entire Rooney family are, they're such a great family and we were fortunate enough to spend some time with them four years and, um, you know, fantastic organization and just what you learn from them is just high level of integrity, just really good people. And Dan, you know, he, he, he shot you straight on everything um, that came down it, when we decided, a uh, funny story, when we, when we got the Browns, of course, we had to call the Rooney family and say, you know, we we're purchasing the Browns. We're not going to be part mm -hmm. of the Steelers. And he said, well, did you have to buy the Browns? <laughs> you know, it was like, could you have bought any other team in the country? Did it have to be the Browns? Did you know that? I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> and so, um, and, it, and that's true. I mean, it, it's kind of one of their biggest rivals and, of course, part of the organization. And then jumps, jumps it up to the Browns for, from his, every point. His influence certainly felt with these two franchises, but his influence has felt league-wide and some of the things that he did in Pittsburgh and around the NFL are things that you have pushed for. For instance, the Browns are very community-oriented. The push you have for education, that all stems back? Yeah, that, I mean, the Rooney family sets a, the high, a high bar in all of the NFL. I mean, it, it obviously is one of the most respected families uh, in the organization, and they, they do set the pace for giving back and being part of the community and caring about um, I mean, you know, everything about the community, uh, um, your mom and dad have just been instrumental in a lot of initiatives in Pittsburgh, and um, you can feel it as part of the, the club. I think, I think it works for, for NFL uh, franchises to be very committed to the community, and, and we hope to do the same thing and try every day to see how we can give back to Cleveland and do a great job. Your dad had what amounted to a manifesto. This is the way each person in the Steelers organization should do their job. This is what their duties were. This is how they better handle it. And if they wavered, they walked. <laughs> well, I, so I, I, you know, my father was, was very clear with things, but he, he was patient with people. I, I don't want it to come across that, um, you know, if, if you if you spilled a, uh, you know some some water on the furniture that you Miss were gone, a field goal. you know, <laughs> you know, he had he had a tremendous amount of patience and, and actually believed in developing folks. But if he felt that you weren't aligned with, you know, bringing us to to the, you know, he talked about greatness all the time, and he never talked about winning the next game. He talked. Of, he had this expectation that we should be great in everything we do, whether it was coaching or you know, any other aspect of the organization. And that's really what he tried to get folks to focus on is, you know, what are you doing to enhance that, that sort of pursuit of greatness? And if he didn't feel you were doing that, he absolutely, 
you know, would, would, would create that separation, but, but I think he also had a lot of patience um, for one to find their way to that path. In the book, he writes about treating the team like an orchestra. You want everybody pulling in the same direction. You want the music to flow wonderfully. Um, he tried to do that for the NFL as well, getting the league to do things that he felt were best for the league, even to the detriment of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, you know, the, 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 I mean, in the short term, some of those things might have been detriment to the Pittsburgh Steelers, but, but a lot of things that he did were working with the Maras and, and the Hallises and the McCaskies, these, you know, the folks in Philadelphia. You know, if, if we didn't have the revenue sharing, if we didn't have the partnerships that we have, uh, my father always believed that there was no way that Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Baltimore could compete with Chicago, Philadelphia, New York. So, so he was constantly working with them to build those partnerships. Um, so, so yes, there were some choices made that, that maybe he put the Steelers on the back burner, but he understood that a strong league certainly benefited the Steelers in a way that a weak league would, you know, would, would be very difficult for us to compete in. And, and you wrote that he watched specifically how the Giants, the Bears, the Packers, and the Browns, before they were part of the league, had been winners. What their offices did, what their coaches did, how they handled their players, all of that he wanted to emulate to create what became a great franchise, but at the time was not. Well, and absolutely, and, and, and probably the biggest step in that was hiring Chuck Knoll, who was an acolyte of Paul mm -hmm. Brown, and, you know, was a native of the east side of Cleveland, went to Benedictine High School, and then came in and helped the Steelers, well, really led the Steelers to four Super Bowl championships. You know, the, I always say that the most important person in Steeler history is Chuck Knoll, and he's from Cleveland. So, uh, you know, <laughs> Chuck transformed us from losers to winners, and, you know, can't say enough about Chuck Knoll and, and what he learned here in Cleveland, both his value system as well as from a football standpoint from Paul Brown. Dee, do you feel like that extends to a city that the football team really needs to be a leader to the people who pull for it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you just have to, you're part of the fiber. I mean, we've talked a lot about how we are just keepers of the franchise. I mean, we're, you know, it belongs to the people of Northeast Ohio. And you can feel that when you're here, um, how important it is. And, and we want, we, our, our job is also to give back as much as possible. I was going to comment a little bit on um, Dan Rooney's NFL admiration of the shield is he taught us and talked a lot about how to protect the shield and how important it is. The NFL is a hundred years old. It's it took a lot of people behind the scenes to move, and it started and stopped lots of times along that hundred-year journey. And and I think that. Um, Dan and your grandfather, of course, and then Dan came along and just kind of kept it going. And so the importance of the shield has this strong um, history of men and women that were committed to making um, the game what it is today. There's a comment in the book about how he thought, not that it should be Denver versus Cleveland or Baltimore versus New York, but he thought sometimes it was the NFL versus the NBA versus Major League Baseball versus the NHL. He really did, as you said, fight to protect that shield. Yeah. That's the way he wanted to be known. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, he had, he had grown up when football was, you know, a sandlot sort of mm -hmm. activity and, and, you know, sort of came of age as, as television was coming about and, and you know, with, with Commissioner Roselle and, and uh, you know, uh, Wellington Mara, so many folks that, that they, they did some of the things that, that Dee said where, you know, now we're, we're you know, beyond certainly what my grandfather and, and my father would have ever imagined uh, you know, back in the 50s this would be. We wanted to talk a lot about diversity and the Rooney Rule. It's a National League policy that requires league teams to interview ethnic minority candidates for head coaching and senior football operations jobs. First implemented in 2003, championed and of course named after the Steelers' late chairman. Variations of the rule are now used in many other industries as well. Uh, someone stemmed it, or characterized it as stemming from his religious upbringing, from his involvement in the civil rights movement, from just wanting to bring people together. Where do you think it came from? Well, you know, I think it, it was something that was important to my family before my father. My grandfather uh, promoted the first open heavyweight championship uh, between two African Americans, Jersey Joe Wolcott and Ezra Charles in 1955. So, so that foundation had been laid. It was something that was important. And then, you know, my father really felt he could, he could implement it into the Steelers, implement um, what, what he would have called integration into the Steelers. We hired uh, a, a scout, one of the first African-American scouts 
in Bill Nunn in 1968, and from 1969 to 76, we drafted more players from HBCUs than any other team, and then that team went on to you know, win four Super Bowl championships in six years. So uh, it was something that was, a, was I, I guess, a natural part of his legacy, and some, but, but something he really felt was, was important to do, and then he believed it would create the competitive advantage that it did. And you pointed out in the book that on the Super Bowl teams, you did have players from the historically black colleges. You had players from Big Ten schools. You had a lot of kids from Ohio on the team as well. You know, Jack Lambert, of course. There were so many things that were designed to build a good football team, but he also wanted to design a good look at America. He brought people in on purpose because they were so different. Right. I, I talk about it in that case. We also talk about his time in Ireland, and, and in Ireland you had this sort of major conflict um, that was that was that we understand as Catholics and Protestants, but but it really was playing out in a much more complex way in, in housing, in in um, voting, in, in uh, workers' rights, and and my father always worked in, in every situation he was all involved, and in also with the, with the players' union to try and bring people together. He really felt that you could have strong differences with someone, but there was no reason not to have some type of dialogue and some some way to to communicate with them. So. So what you saw on the field was sort of an extension of, of, I think, one of his major beliefs, which was there's always a way to work something out with someone else. The Browns certainly bought in. Uh, we've had coaches, Jackson, Cornell, who were African-American. It really does enter into your psyche, not just because there's a rule, but you wanted to give people a fair shake. Absolutely. I mean, I think, of course, Dan Rooney uh, has had such a powerful impact on the NFL, and now it it, it it goes to a corporate America, which mm -hmm. is just the impact is long lasting. But it, it's the right thing to do, and uh, it's a good thing to do. Your organi organization is going to be better. Um, that your culture is going to be better. It's it it you know it's it's a priority within our organization, and we do it in our and and we put it in our companies as well. It's interesting though when we look at 2019, we have four coaches of color in the NFL, the lowest numbers since the Rooney Rule went in. Three African Americans in Pittsburgh and Miami and Los Angeles and Rivera in Charlotte. Is it disappointing that it's not gone further than where we are? Well, you know, look, I think with diversity, numbers are important. Um, but if you look at, you know, from 1920 to 2003, you had seven minority mm -hmm. hires. And then since 2003, since the Rooney Rule, along with general managers, you have 30. So, so I think my father, you know, would believe that, that there has been progress. Uh, he also was always committed to the long run. He understood that, that any of these initiatives, whether it was the Rooney Rule, the, the peace process in Ireland, that if you're going to make major changes, um, it's going to take a long time to really establish them. So he would, now he would always be rigorous. He would, he would want us to be pushing the boundaries and finding out are there new best practices that we should be considering? Is there more knowledge out there? Have, you know, is there some way you can improve it? But he also had an appreciation that um, if you're going to make real substantial change, that's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's sometimes the makeup of a city that determines who they want to bring in as the coach? We look right now at uh, Miami. They're like the 50th most diverse city. Cleveland and Pittsburgh, oddly enough, are almost back to back at 56 and 58. Um, does it matter what the populace is when you're looking? And I know you've only done it for the one team. but. You know, haven't ever thought of that. I mean, that's a, that's kind of an in interesting thought. But but no, I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think the NFL is actively developing um, minority coaches. I mean, that is a priority within the NFL. We work really hard at it. Is ha and they have um, they have programs that you go into and and they train for leadership and. I think it's something that we're going to continue to work really hard on. It's not something we take lightly. It's a priority. It's at the top of the list, and we're going to continue to work really hard on it. And as an organization, we're going to continue to work hard on it, too. Next step for a lot of people is the inclusion of LGBT players. Not that there aren't any now. It's just that they aren't spoken of. We don't necessarily know who they are. The league hasn't followed where baseball is, where they talk to all of their players coming through the minors about it in the beginning of the season. Is that something the NFL needs to maybe address a little bit differently? Have you had owners' conversations about that? You know, we haven't had a lot of conversation about it. So I, I think that's something that will evolve. I, I think as other, other sports teams evolve, I think, I think that's something that will be uh, obviously a conversation mm -hmm. within the organization and for the players to feel comfortable and welcomed. And 
Um, I, th I think that is something, you know, that it's like a family in that locker room, and they take care of each other. So I, I think in, in a lot of cases it, it kind of works out that the, the players feel pretty comfortable in the locker room because they care about each other as people. Rick, one thing on the league that I, I do feel, ver feel very good about right now as it, as it relates to diversity is, is D, is, is Katie uh, Brown-Blackburn in, in Cincinnati, is Gail Benson in New Orleans, um, Kim Peluga up in, mm -hmm. up in Buffalo, um, obviously Martha Ford, uh, although she's, she's been around a little longer than the rest of us. I think she's 92 running the line. Fantastic, but, yeah. yes. Um, but, you know, the generation before, my mother had, had influence, um, you know, Mrs. McCaskey had influence, but it was much quieter. It was not that, that they were at the table in the same way that, that Dee and, and some of the other folks are. So, you know, you, you had my father, I, I believe, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope took, a, took a, a leadership position, but now I think that you have a situation where you, you're getting a, a situation where you're going to have, you know, a mass, a much larger group of people being able to, to speak to these issues, speak from an experience that my father certainly never could have. So I'm excited for, for the NFL from that standpoint, and, and Dee has been very much a leader in that you know, um, for since she's been involved with the Browns. So, so I think we got, we have some, we have a big asset there, um, not only just with D, which is great, but also with the fact that, that we've made that uh, transition to, to having women really having a significant voice in the owner's room that they never did before. Don't underestimate your mother. <laughs> she had. She has a great deal of influence. <laughs> While we're talking about women, there's only one female official in the league right now. Is that something else that should be addressed? Yeah, I think it. I think it evolved too. I think. I think that's another one of those things that you put a priority on, and you know, it's training and development, and and women wanting to be part of it and stepping up and and doing it. I, I think it, you'll see it evolve and happen. You mentioned your dad um, didn't have the opportunity to talk about homosexual players in the league, but I bet he'd have spoken out on Colin Kaepernick. And I bring that up because it's topical again this week. We learned that Colin has a private workout scheduled for Saturday. Ten teams now have promised to send people there. Would Dan Rooney have spoken out against this blackballing or this? It's, there's not a ban. Nobody said you can't hire him, but nobody has over three seasons. Well, that, that's a hard question for me to answer. Um, you know, I, my father's not, not with us, so I, I, I don't want to put words into his mm -hmm. mouth with him not being here. I do know that, you know, my father was always willing to, to step up in difficult situations, but he also was committed to any, any type of change that initiative that he got involved with was always looking at the long term. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly how that relates, but I, but I know that was sort of his mindset, and, and I talk about that in the book, about how he stepped up but when he stepped up it was it was quieter it was about um, creating processes and procedures that would change things um, so so that's sort of how he uh, embraced change and, and took change on I really can't speak beyond that you okay. know, what, what he might do I'm going to go back to the time when that happened after the president came out with his comments about SOB ought to be fired etc the Green Bay Packers issued a statement then which I'll read this is from September of 2017 says the NFL family is one of the most diverse communities in the world. Just look around. The eclectic group of players that you root for, the coaches you admire, the people you sit next to in the stands, those high-fiving on military bases, fans at the sports bar or during tailgate parties. We all come from different walks of life and have unique backgrounds and stories. A real kumbaya moment there, Dee, but the NFL we live in today, top to bottom, um, yeah, we are very, very different people. Do you want the football team to reflect the fact that we have high dollar and low dollar black and white people of all religions and ethnicities that love Cleveland Browns football or Pittsburgh Steelers football. I mean, I think that's I think that's the point. Is is it, it, it's it, it's a, the NFL or sports in general the most unifying thing? You can be. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, or what you believe, or your definitely not your political beliefs. But it's really all about rooting for a team that means so much to a community. It really does bring everybody together. You'll see that tonight. Um, you know, you'll have Steelers fans and Browns fans, but they're very united on Sharing together a for this team. Beer, and right? it, it is kind of, it is kind of a nice break from the, all the really hard stuff in life to yes. cheer on your team that stands for your community. So I, I think it's very re reflective of the community. I mean, we're, you know, the Cleveland Browns fan 
you know, it, it, every NFL team argues they have the best fans out there. We really think we have a unique fan base um, that loves football. Mm -hmm. When you think about, you know, no owner has said, I'm not going to hire this guy, Kaepernick. But, I mean, you have a quarterback worth keeping now. You have a quarterback worth keeping now. I figure like somebody would We have hope said. we have two. <laughs> you hope, yeah, yes. Actually, three. We have played three this year. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think if it, I think a team will will definitely pick him up if it, if it fits in within their team and he's he's a good player. I mean, they want you want to win, get football games. Right. And, and I don't know if you noticed, but you do everything you can to win a football game, and you get the best players you can get, and you come up with the best scheme. And I think this is part of it. I think it's all about getting the right, the best players on there. So I absolutely think he has an opportunity if he's playing well. I, I don't know. I'm not a good scout on the ability to play you football have or not. <laughs> when we look at um, where the Browns are now compared to when you first came in, compared to when they came back in 1999. You've got to be proud of this franchise and the way this community embraces it and they embrace the town. Um, extremely proud of it. Extremely proud of what the Browns stand for in Cleveland. It's really important whether we win or lose. You know, it really makes a difference mm -hmm. in this community. Um, really extremely appreciative of the support um, that the fans give the team. I mean, these are young men out there fighting really hard to win a game. And I really appreciate the support of the fans, of, of all the people. I mean, they're, they, they, are, they um, care deeply uh, for Cleveland and to win for Cleveland. So, yes, I'm excited. About, and I'm so excited about tonight. Yeah. Do they come up to you? <laughs> do they come up to you? Do they talk to you? Do they give you suggestions? They say, you know, do or do not play Nick Chubb? <laughs> they don't. They don't to me. So <laughs> they don't usually talk to me about that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm more, you know the encourager, the mom, the, you know, make everybody feel okay, they bring out the chicken soup. I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the job. Okay. That's my job. Okay, thank you. I'm Rick Jackson. Today we are at the Westfield Insurance Studio Theater, the Idea Center, listening to a special city club forum with Cleveland Browns co-owner Dee Haslam and Jim Rooney, author of A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, city club members, guests, students, those of you joining us via our live stream. If you have a question, please form a line. We have microphones here in the studio on both sides. Our team members and staff members are standing there. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. Our staff will try and work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point so we can get to as many as possible. We see folks lining up already because they want to talk to these two fantastic guests. May we have the first question, please? Yeah, thank you both for being here. 20-year uh, resident of Cleveland, grew up in Pittsburgh, so I brought my terrible towel. As you think about uh, the Rooney Rule, this certainly was less about checking a box and more about a culture change. So with your respective organizations, have you seen where that has trickled down into some of the other areas of the organization or your work within the community? Okay, why don't you go first? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean it's very much part of our organization. I mean, we talk about it. You know, do we have a diverse candidate for that position? And if we don't, why not? And uh, I think it's really important. I think everybody is well aware of it. Uh, we have a very diverse office. And uh, it really does, it, the culture of it, it does make a, a huge difference in the culture. So I think on, uh, you know, one of the things my father was sort of known for uh, that, that, that you can really put your finger on, I hope there's several, but, but was hiring. And, you know, in the, in the, the, the story of Mike Tomlin's hire, uh, really spells out the spirit of the Rooney Rule because we had actually, you know, completed the Rooney Rule requirement with the interview of Coach Ron Rivera, who is, you know, now the coach of the uh, Carolina Panthers. But we started with, I believe it's 37 candidates, went down to 12, went down to four, and then picked Mike. And my father always believed that he had great respect for the media, but, you know, that you don't let the media pick your starting quarterback. You don't worry if you're going to get a bad story on Monday because this coach went to that team or that coach went to that team. That when you're doing this, when you're involved in a process that, that is this significant, that you take your time, that you're deliberate, uh, and that that's where diversity really fits in. And, and Tony Dungy, you know, talked about the, the spirit of the Rooney Rule and that that hire was sort of, you know, totally consistent with what he tried to do. That process was what he also used, you know, fundamentally with, with 
uh, um, Bill Cowher, and a similar process with Chuck Knoll. So the idea of slowing it down and then bringing diverse candidates into the fold, I think really allows you to, to, to get a stronger sense of how they're going to fit into your culture, how they're going to enhance your culture, and, and, and make those decisions from that standpoint rather than sort of, you know, just do it sort of off the bat. Three coaches in 50 years, I think the plan worked. <laughs> Let's go to the other side of the studio here. What are your thoughts about the, the prospect of the NFL establishing a team in London? Do you think that's practical, doable, and uh, how high an agenda item is it for the league and the other owners? I mean, I, I do think it's a possibility. I mean, they, it obviously has been talked about. When you go over to London, uh, I mean, it, uh, there's the, it's, it's in a different kind of experience. Uh, the fans don't necessarily wear the teams that are playing. They wear their jerseys, the they, team they've associated with. So it's more of a... Uh, this festive kind of atmosphere it's not that you know the competition and like we have here it's just a different atmosphere it's it's a lot of fun and uh, we enjoyed our time over there I, I think it's a discussion I don't think there's been a decision made but I do think there's an opportunity there and and the fans seem to love it I, I think that's, that's 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 the perfect answer I mean that's that's where the NFL stands right now I guess. What about the logistical challenges of it though I mean, there's logistic challenges when we fly across to the West Coast to play out there. I mean, you know, there's, there's, the, there, it's logistic, there's lots of logistics no matter where we travel. There's a lot of people that we travel. So I think it's just, a, it's just an hour, just a, the hours that are different, but it's, it's still the same amount of work to get over there that it is to go to the West Coast. If it was on the agenda, yeah, you know, I hadn't thought about it yet. I think it would depend on who it is and and what it means and what it looks like. It's kind of a puzzle. Uh, I haven't, it hadn't come up to to talk about yet, so I, I don't know. If I can follow Tom's question, would you think the same thing about Mexico City? Um, I think there's opportunity there too. I think that's a possibility. I think London's probably a little further mm -hmm. out, closer to that reality. But I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know that it would be impossible to do that okay. either. It's a little closer. Yeah, little. <laughs> for now, certain me, teams, it's a lot closer. Now I'll get in a little trouble for saying this, but the Steelers are the second most popular team in Mexico, so I'm happy with how <laughs> things are. You're good with that one. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I have a question regarding, um, there was an, a New York Times article yesterday, I believe, about the concern of players' health care. And as, an as a business operation and you providing health care for your players and sacrificing their time on the field for their health, personal health and well-being, could you address some of the personal health care as a business, the challenges you're facing? Well, the, I mean, the Players Association kind of drives all of that. So I, I did not read the article, so I don't really know what it said. So I'm a little bit at a disadvantage, but there's a lot of different factors that go into that, and the Players Association is heavily involved in that. How much do the owners and the Players Association agree on things? I mean, we hear about the confrontations. Look, the health and well-being of the players is really important. You don't have a game without it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you've seen the changes in the, in the rules for safety, which has frustrated a lot of fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to take care of the players and you've got to take care of the quarterback. And so the rules, are, the safety rules are in place and we continue to work on science for helmets that will impact uh, the military will make a difference in so many other people's lives with the technology we continue to work mm -hmm. out. I, I think it's really important, and I think we can impact uh, other sports and other uses by really spending time on that science. So it's it's really important part of what we do. Interesting. You talk about other sports. Do you have a lot of conversations with hockey, with baseball, with basketball? I think the technology is one of those things that, that there's a lot of conversation on about. And there's a, there's a group of doctors that work continually on the health and safety of these players and looking at turning over every rock and looking at every aspect to make sure we do, do everything correctly to make, them, make it as healthy and safe as possible. Thanks. We have, a, we have a question from Twitter. How do players discuss the Rooney Rule and the way the NFL is currently handling diversity and inclusion? What do players tell you that they want and care about? So, you know, I, I remember my, my grandfather who started the Steelers in 32, uh, 1932. I said some, you know, I was 
15, 16 years old, made some quip about these players today, you know, and this was, this was 40 years ago. And he said, you know, the players today are not that much different than the players were in 1932. And I think that that is always the case. You have a group of, you know, 60 people from all over the country and now to some degree all over the world, and you have a whole lot more opinions than folks think they have amongst themselves. These guys, some of them are the brightest people you've ever met. Some of them have, have not focused on, on some, of, some of those things. I mean, you just have this very diverse mindset within a locker room. And I, I think it's, um, I, I, was, I was, it was made clear to me by, by you know, one of the founders of the league to not, you know, not get caught up in that idea that, that there's this uh, one sort of monolithic viewpoint in the locker room. I think it is, I think diversity is an important issue to the players. I think it's important that, you know, there is some level that their bosses have some experiences that are similar to them, um, whether that's based on race or, or, or something else. Um, so, you know, I think those are important issues to them, but there's no monolithic viewpoint in the locker room. Mm -hmm. Lines are short, they're open. Go ahead. Hi, Dee and Jim, it's nice to see you both. Jim, I remember having this conversation with you on the sideline at a Gilmore game. I I'm concerned that uh, football is a dying sport. You know, when, when we were growing up, Catholic schools, my, my growing up, every school had at least one team. Some, some schools had two. Now it takes three, four, five parishes to field one eighth grade team. Is that a concern? And, and how are you both, and as owners, how are you dealing with this issue? Yeah, I think sports is, it engages students, by it, music, art, sports engage students, so it's really important that athletics are part of a program within a school. And we've worked really hard on youth football. It fits what we do because one of the reasons we do is we want to keep kids engaged and keep them in school, so it's not all self-serving about growing the sport. Um, I, think, I think there are challenges in all the sports. Uh, because there's so many uh, things for kids' time. I mean, you see, it's not just football, it's every sport that um, the kids are involved in a lot of different activities that are, not, they have so many choices. There's so many choices, which is fantastic because you want kids to be engaged and go to school. But I do think that football is extremely popular. And, um, you know, 19 of the 20 top shows last year were football games. NFL football games. So you, you, when you think about the popularity, I, I think that sport is something that you have to continue to grow among youth because there is so much, um, uh, so much uh, demanding their time, so much going going on. And there's, they're pulled in so many different directions. So we'll continue to hopefully they pick football is some place they want to spend their time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, another, uh, you know, piece of this that that I think is is important is that you know football is in my mind, the greatest game and certainly the greatest team game there is. You know, when you look at the net sports, hockey, uh, basketball, uh, soccer, everyone's basically doing the same thing. There's an intricacy in football where you have, you know, the, you have offensive linemen, you have receivers, you have running backs, obviously you have quarterbacks. The defense, you basically have three different positions. And for these folks to learn team teamwork under those intricacies, mm -hmm. in that complex situation, is it's just a better way to learn how to work on a team than any other sport. So I think, you know, that is that is a value that, that kids that play football get an understanding of how to do that in a very meaningful way. I think also he was he didn't mention it, but the idea that there's so many moms that don't want their boys to play until they're, you know, bigger than we are rather than the Pee Wee leagues. Is that the concern that when kids are starting so late they don't develop they don't become great college players and then don't become great NFL players. Well, I, I think D really addressed this. You know, I think that, look, there's always going to be need for improvement, but, but you know, we and, and, you know, especially under Commissioner Goodell, who gets, gets some criticism, you know, the NFL has led the way in safety for all mm -hmm. sports for the last 10 years, and there has been significant advancements both in health, in technology, as well as, 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 well as awareness of it. Yeah, we've developed uh, a rookie tackle, and that's mm -hmm. to delay, but to continue flag football a little bit longer. It's kind of a modified football, um, and and we it's we're growing it around the country. It's a fantastic program, so mothers feel better about it, and it uh, it 
helps the kids learn the safety of the game. And it's important for them to learn how to tackle correctly. Good point. Yes. Hi, Jim. Hi, Dee. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Um, I actually just wanted to ask a question in terms of the Rooney Rule and kind of the evolution of the game, thinking long term. Um, and Jim, you won't be surprised being in the first co-ed class at an all-boys school. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of standing up for Sarah, well, it's a different debate on soccer. But um, the question is with Carly Lloyd's field goal and evolving uh, the evolution of the Rooney Rule and the teams, and, and do, can either of you comment in terms of uh, when in the future, if ever in the future, you see women entering the game? So. I'll address the Carly Lloyd and then I'll let Dee, Dee speak to the larger issue, but, but there's no question in my mind that if Carly Lloyd can you know, kick field goals in from, from 50 yards out, she's going to get an opportunity. You, know, <laughs> you see too many teams losing you know, with kicks at the end of the game. If she can put it through the, the uprights, I, I think she'll get an opportunity. I agree. I agree. I think if there's, there's somebody that can play, and th they'll get an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. We have another question from Twitter. What are the three core elements that you want to see as cultural components of your team? Could be an essay question. Yeah, uh, yeah that. <laughs> I wrote an essay on it. <laughs> yeah, you can start on that one then. <laughs> uh, sure. So, you know, I think what my father did was he always played the long game. He looked as far down the horizon as you can and, and tried to make decisions based on you know, how far you go down, the, so, so patience is part of that long game. Uh, you know, he always talked about, you know, everyone I talked to talked about do the right thing. And what he meant by that, what, how these folks define that was, is that, you know, do you feel good about the decision you made when you, after you made it? Not that you feel selfish, not that you got something out of it, but you really feel like you did something well and, and that you contributed in some way. And then the third was he was, you know, really good at balancing um, it sort of is, is, is what he described to people from Pittsburgh and Cleveland, this toughness and kindness. My father was very, very confident. He had great vision. You know, he was a good decision maker. Uh, everything you would want in a boss, but he also, and these weren't compartmentalized, he also was able to really balance that with appreciation for everyone involved. So um, when the Steelers are at, at our best, those three elements are, are in our culture. And I, I would say, I would just repeat that that it's te team is really important. There's no I in team. It's about the working together as a team becomes very important uh, in any any organization, but definitely on the football field. Hi, D. Hi. Uh, this is a question for you, D. Um, it strikes me that NFL ownership is um, a franchise ownership is really different than other businesses. There is. Um, at the end of the day, there's, as you alluded to earlier, there's, you know, you're not deciding whether or not to run Chubb. You're, you're staying out of the, those decisions, and there's so much that you don't control. Um, and I just wanted to invite the two of you to reflect on that a little bit. The how, um, how owning an NFL franchise and and doing this work is really different than other kinds of work than producing television shows, for instance. Well, I would run Chubb, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, We'd all be better yeah, off if we ran the ball more. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it's a balance. I mean, I think you know, uh, if you have any self-awareness, you know where you fit in and, and what your, where your opinion matters. And uh, it's very different running a, a team. Uh, I, we, Jimmy and I used to joke all the time that, no one, no, there's, there's 32 different teams and they're great business partners, but they don't tell you anything about football. Jimmy called Mr. Rooney one day and he was getting ready to interview for a coach and, and he said, um, well, Dan, should I interview so-and-so? And he said, Jimmy, you ought to interview him. And then he asked him again, Dan, well, what about so-and-so? He said, well, you ought to interview him. And then he asked him another question and, he, and Jimmy said, Dan, you're not going to tell me one thing, are you? And of course he wasn't. And, and, and you know, he valued his opinion more than anybody. That's the reason he called Dan Rooney to ask his opinion. And now, when it comes to the sport, where it's, it's pretty much black and white, we, we talk about business, we don't talk about the sport much. It's, it's really interesting because we have our league meetings in March, and the experiences we have, I mean, Dee is being unbelievably kind today and, and helping me with, with this project, um, but this is, this is unbelievably rare that, that 
someone would sit down because you feel, you know, you feel an intensity in October, November, that in March, when, when the league meetings are, it is, you know, the most cordial. We all have fun together. It's this wonderful time, and they're, you know, it's almost, they're almost Jekyll and Hyde experiences. So. Yeah, it really is weird. Yeah, <laughs> very much. You mentioned the book, Jim. Did you write it for someone in specific? Did you write it for Steelers fans, for Browns fans, for NFL fans? Who'd you target that to? Well, you know, we're, we're hoping that folks who are interested in leadership would, will, will have interest in the book. Um, you know, we, we, we really try to tell a story uh, about, you know, we live in this world, and, and, and again, my, my father would, would not like uh, me to be speaking or, or him to, to come across as holier than thou. He, he was not like that. Um, but I also, I, I, I believe that, that he did this fantastic job of managing his influence. There's always a relationship between influence and power. And, you know, he was able to always come down, or, well, not always, but, but you know, he, he came down on the side of responsibility and accountability with that influence and rarely got caught up in the trappings of success and power and those things. And I, I believe that's an important story to be told and for someone to have had the success he had and to be able to give examples of that. That's, mm -hmm. that's really what I was hoping to do with the book. Well, I, for one, enjoyed it, so. <laughs> Good. Tweet, Horace? Another one from Twitter. What are you most proud of when you think of your charitable work in the community? <laughs> well, Dee does so much, so she's looking at me to go first. Um, so, you know, I mean, and, and Dee comes from a, a family business, too. I mean, it, it you know, my, my father, you know, he, he gets frustrated when our marketing folks come in and talk about, and they're doing a job, and they're doing a, a very important job, but talk about fans from a customer profile standpoint. My father grew up. Uh, what is now about 200 yards from Heinz Field, and he see he always saw our fans as neighbors, and my grandfather I think felt that same way, and there was this this fidelity in that relationship. So, you know, certainly things he did for the American Ireland Fund and, and that, that contribution to the peace process is something you'd point to. He was head of the United Way for America, that was something you'd point to, but I really think he would believe his biggest contribution was trying to make the, the, the Steelers reflect the people of Pittsburgh and doing it over and over again in a way that they could feel good about who we were. Yeah, that's great. We, we, I, I think we, several things we've worked on in the community, we're really excited about um, what we're doing in chronic absenteeism because we do think if we can get kids to go to school, um, they're going to graduate and, and do well in life. So that's really important to us. You, you know, we work, we work hard on youth football, and we're active in social justice issues, too. That uh, means a lot to our players, and so we work really hard there, too. You know, we, we try to stay focused on education because we do think everybody has a right to a great education, so we work hard there. So that must be a, a big thing in Cleveland, because my son, who went to Gilmore Academy here in Cleveland, is a teacher in Denver now. So <laughs> he's, he's trying to live out that, that same ambition in Cleveland, and he talks about absenteeism and, and right. engaging with the children in, in sixth and seventh grade. So that is, that's, I'm, I'm glad that that value is so important. And, and here's, here's an example of someone taking it forward. That's great. We, we see so many things that the team does. It's one thing, I think, when the owner comes out and speaks to folks, but you want to get the players involved. If, if Baker walks in and starts speaking, a schoolroom is going to pay more attention, I'm sorry, than if D walks in. You know, is it important to you that the players buy in to what management is preaching? Well, not buy into what we're pre preaching. Buy in to being involved in the community, yes. It's critically important. It develops them as men. Um, you know, so much has been given to them. There were coaches and teachers in their lives all the way, all the way up the ladder to get them to be NFL players. That didn't happen by accident. A lot of people put a lot of time into it. So we, we believe, and in, in our players are these kind of young men as they, they like to give back. They like to be out in the community. They're, they're in the community as much as they can, and they have causes back at their, in their homes, too. I mean, they don't just do it here in Cleveland. They go back home, and they get involved with their kid, the kids there, too. I mean, a lot of the players are involved in, with kids. 
um, that's their cause. They're, they have lots of different interests, but we support them and their cause. And, and, and chronic absenteeism is something that, that they care about too, so it works both ways. Sure. So, so I, I've, had, I've had the you know, pretty cool experience to be around a lot of players. And one of the most um, special moments in my life, I've, I've gotten to know Jim Brown, who was the greatest football player to ever put on a jersey, you know, you know bar none, and, and absolutely. Um, and, and Jim talked about his work in prisons, and it was one of the most powerful conversations I've ever been in. My son, who I just mentioned, it was he and I and, and Jim Brown. And um, just the impact of that conversation and, and how invested he was with people, you know, who, who obviously have, you know, tremendous challenges and, and you know, a whole bunch of, of difficulties that I, I can't even explain in, in such a short form. But the power and the, the investment and the intensity had in that conversation, uh, it just had a really big impact on me. And, um, and so, so Jim was, was one of my favorite guys to watch on, on films from before I was born. But, but that day he really transformed into a, a real hero for me. That's cool. Yes, sir. I thank you both for being here today for this great program. Um, one of the hallmarks of the Steelers uh, organization, of course, is continuity. One family ownership since 1932, three coaches in 50 years. Um, and, uh, you know, presumably that's important to the Steelers, continuity. And you see it uh, exemplified. Um, it, the Browns have not been so continuous, if you will, and they've had some challenges over the years, both with management and ownership and with coaching. And I was wondering, since today's program is about the culture of the organizations, the differences and maybe some similarities, uh, if each of you could address respectively how continuity is important within your organization and what you're trying to accomplish and how uh, the challenges of lack of continuity within the organization uh, impacts, uh, impacts the culture of the organization itself. So I'll start on this, Steve. So for 40 years, the Steelers were the worst team in football. And, you know, in 1948, we had this, or 44, we combined with the Cardinals during the war. Um, I think we threw eight touchdown passes and 41 interceptions. Our best player quit football completely. Off the field, we had this uh, a little bit later. We had one car sponsorship, and the car couldn't go uphill, and we live in Pittsburgh. So my father had to drive past the drive that the stadium was on and put the car in reverse to go up the hill. <laughs> so it took us 40 years to get to this point where you talk about this continuity. You know, Dee and Jimmy have been at this, what, six years? Seven. So, so um, you know, you, you, you still are 30-some years ahead of us, and, and I think you're going in the right direction. So um, continuity was certainly important to my father, but it took a long time to, to get to the point where you could establish it. Um, it's been, hard, it's been a hard journey, and our results have not been what we would have hoped, but we're working really hard every day, and, and, and we strive to get better every day, and that's what we do. Jim, as we wrap, if there's something you want people to take away from the book, from this hour, from the lessons learned in the NFL, what would that be? Well, you know, I, I think I, I, I tried to mention some of them that... Um, you know, you can be a good person and still win. Uh, I think that's, that's the fundamental lesson. Um, and then being in Cleveland, I, I, I love being back in Cleveland. Um, as I said, I, I, was, I was here, um, you know, for, for three formative years of my life. My brother Art, who's the team president, spent time here. My sister went to John Carroll. And my mother chose to send us to school in Cleveland because the people in Cleveland carry the same values that, that she certainly believes the people in Pittsburgh had, but, but this common decency, this, this, this you know, uncommon integrity, and um, you know, so, so it's just always a pleasure to be back here. Mm -hmm. From growing up there and spending my adult life here, I always tell people that we really are the same city except for that AFC North problem. That's it. Um, <laughs> is, is that the way you see it, that these cities are so intertwined that we need this rivalry, this should be the way the NFL works? In a lot of cases, it is how the NFL works. I mean, you, you know, you, it, you had this amazing rivalry, but people are, are really pretty much the same. And I think we're just a great example of, mm -hmm. 
Pittsburgh and Cleveland are a true true example of even our country. I mean, we all have we have differences, but but at the end of the day, we're really a, a whole lot alike. Mm -hmm. That is a good place to put it. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you for you. being here Thank as you well. So much. <laughs> Today at the Westfield Studio Theater at the Idea Center at Playhouse Square, we've been listening to a special city club forum with Cleveland Browns co-owner Dee Haslam and Jim Rooney, author of A Different Way to Win, Dan Rooney's story from the Super Bowl to the Rooney Rule. Today's forum is part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all of the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through that public program. That brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Dee Haslam. Thank you, Jim Rooney. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club. With special thanks to our City Club members whose financial support makes our work possible. To find out more about the upcoming forums and how you can support the City Club, please visit us online at cityclub.org. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.